Hello, I'm Gaynor Davis, and I'm the Executive Director of the Connecticut River Museum, and I welcome you to one of our, I guess it's our second in the series, Speakers Series, and it's very um, exciting for me to be able to introduce Catherine A. Hermes. Uh, she received her AB in History cum laude from the University of Cal uh, California, Irvine, her Master's and her Master's of Philosophy in History from Yale University. She also has a JD from Duke University School of Law. And finally, she has a PhD in Colonial American History from Yale. So we're very excited about having her here. She has taught at Central Connecticut State University in the History Department since 1997 and served as the department chair from 2012 to 2018. She teaches courses on Anglo-American legal history and Native Americans of the Eastern Woodlands, as well as other courses in early America. She is co-author with Alexandria Marvel of several articles and book chapters on Native American history in New England, and the author of several chapters on Native legal history. She is the director of the Uncovering Their History Project, which I think is what she's talking about tonight. And she oversaw and conducted research for this project, and she supervised the building of the family and relationship trees, as well as the website. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Catherine Hermes. Can everyone hear me all right? Yes. Okay. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here tonight. This is a fabulous turnout. Um, I am sorry that the website, that I can't show you the website, but if you are on your phones, you're welcome to look at it. Um, it's so nice to be at the Connecticut River Museum. Um, I just love Essex. It's just a beautiful town. You're very lucky to live here or live near. Um, so let me just tell you a little bit about the website. Um, the Ancient Burying Ground Association uh, put out a call for papers for us to, uh, or for people to come up with proposals to discover the Native and African people who were buried in Hartford's Ancient Burying Ground, the one on Main Street uh, and Gold Streets. And we answered that call. We built a website that has a profile for each person we found that we believe is buried in the burying ground. So when you're navigating the website, you go to the list of profiles, it will bring up a name, you can click on the name, and what you will see when you click on a name is all of the information that we have for that person. So it, it may be slim, it may be a lot. We have a bibliography that tells you where we got the information, so if you want to go and look at more information about that person or start your own research, you can do that. We have, every person for whom we have a name is linked to an Ancestry.com tree. So if you use Ancestry.com, you can log into your own account and it will take you to that tree. If you don't have an Ancestry.com tree, you can sign up for a free account. Um, for like, a, I think they have a 14 day trial and you can see our family trees. Now, because, because when you're working with um, native people and also people who are of African descent, sometimes it's very hard to put together family trees. Um, you know, with Ancestry.com, how many of you have used Ancestry.com or, or a genealogical tree? So you know what it's like. You can have your, you know, 100th cousin a thousand times removed. As long as you know how you're related to that person, it can be on your family tree. But you can't put your best friend, your business partner, and one thing important to us that we could not put in was fictive kin, masters. We couldn't put the master-slave relationship in. So a team at CCSU and I created relationship tree. It's found at relationshiptree.org, and I have to update the security certificate for that, so you might get a warning, but it's perfectly safe. Um, relationshiptree.org, 
um, can then map relationships or graph relationships that are not just biological or genealogical. And so we've been able to put in you know, lawsuits and, as I say, master-slave relationships, fictive kin relationships, neighbors, and that kind of thing. Um, the website also has several narratives. Um, and the narratives try to fill out stories that we thought were thematic, so family structure, the transatlantic slave trade, and, that, and, and subjects like that. Um, so I hope that you enjoy exploring the website, and I'm gonna, tonight, I'm gonna tell you some of the stories from the website and tell you what we found. But the website itself is worth um, going to and playing around with it, and we hope that people will connect up even their own family trees with some of the work we've done, and we've had, um, I've had uh, inquiries from people, including a descendant of Turramugus. Some of you may have heard of Turramugus, who was in Weathersfield. He was a Wangunk. Um, I have now been in contact with one of his descendants. We've also been in contact with some of the descendants of the Lord families, and you'll be hearing more about them tonight. Okay, so thank you all for being here. In the beginning was death. The first African person recorded to have been laid to rest in Hartford was Louis Burbis, an enslaved man. Do you want to lay down? <laughs> <laughs> I can see. All right. An enslaved man whose Dutch master, Gisbert Updike, murdered him in 1639 on the shores of the Great River, the Connecticut River, that ran past the Wongong town of Sukiog, the Dutch fort called the House of Hope and the English village known as Hartford. Burbis was probably buried on or near the fort. The first reference to a burying ground in the English land records is in February 1639-40, because we're on old style uh, dating. Um, it says the graveyard was abutted by parcels belonging to John Skinner, who sold it to John Biddle on the west, Tom, Thomas Lord on the south, and Seth Grant on the north. Richard Lord also had land abutting the burying ground on the south. It was enlarged by, quote, two rods or more uh, abutting upon the burying place, approximately half an acre, when the town acquired land from Richard Olmsted. So this was something that we were able to correct, that Olmsted didn't donate all the land for the burying ground. There had already been land set aside, and he enlarged it. Thereafter, most of the African people, some of the native people, and nearly all of the white colonists who died in Hartford were buried in what we know as the ancient burying ground at the intersection of present-day Main Street and Gold Street. The ancient burying ground today is a site that largely showcases the white English Puritan founders of Hartford. Indeed, the very word founders probably evokes in our minds a picture of white men in large hats and wide collars with Bibles in hand, not unlike the statue of Samuel Stone, you see on the left there, um, in front of the burying ground, and Thomas Hooker in front of the old state house. Um, we might also envision the Puritan family fleeing religious persecution in Old England memorialized on the Traveler's Plaza across the way at One Tower Square. You can see that um, safe arrival is what they're called. Um, yet what we learned and what is showcased on the website uncovering their history is that Hartford was founded and built by people far more diverse than those statues would have us believe. The founding of Hartford began with an invitation to the English from a Wanga chief who sent a messenger named Waginicut, first to Plymouth, where the pilgrims lived, and then to Massachusetts, where the Puritans lived, to come settle amongst the Wangunk, Sequassum, Sachem of Sukyog, and Sequin, his father and the Grand Sachem, wanted English colonists to live with them, not to replace them. Right? So they were hoping for a bicultural community. 
they sought to make an alliance, as they did with other tribes in the region like the Narragansett, Podunk, and Tungsus. In 1636, the English came, composed a document called the Fundamental Orders in 1637 to govern them, and established Hartford as the capital of the Connecticut colony. No one knows who the first Africans were to come to the Connecticut colony, but it was not long before people from all over the Atlantic world resided in Hartford. The Pequot War had forced Native women and children into the households of many colonial white families, but it also led Native men being sold into slavery in places like Providence Island and Bermuda. The war opened the door of the slave trade to New England. Enslaved Africans were exchanged for Native prisoners. Three generations of men named Richard Lord built Hartford's trade network to the Caribbean that resulted in the forcible migration of Africans to Connecticut. The Lords owned a plantation with Samuel Willis and others in the Caribbean called the Cabbage Tree Plantation. Some of its workers were brought to Connecticut. Others, besides the Lords, shipped more, hundreds more. What we can say for certain is that Native and African men and women were among Hartford's founding generations. They lived and died here from its earliest days, fought in wars like the Pequot War, King Philip's War, the French and Indian War, and the American Revolution. They were not rare inhabitants, nor marginal to the town's development. Records from the colony, the town, the courts, the church, and later the federal government bear witness to their presence and contributions, and yet those same records have not yielded up the stories in the same way that they have the stories of Winthrop's, Trumbull's, and Wadsworth's. And not to pick on any particular three or anything, but just the old families. Um, we must think about why that is. My team and I were charged with finding and documenting the Native African and African American people buried in the ancient burying ground. In theory, this should not have been a hard task. There were sextants lists of burials printed in the 19th century, and there were archival church records preserved on microfilm in the state library. There were land records, probate records, and for the 18th century, newspapers. Occasionally, one could find diaries and account books. But these sources that are so good at providing details about white colonists can both offer and obscure information about people of color. So I'm going to tell you some of their stories, and I invite you to read others on the website under the narratives category that I mentioned, and in the fall 2019 issue of Connecticut Explored, the state's history magazine, if any of you subscribe to that or can get access to a copy. As I tell the tales we uncovered, I will also explain further the difficulties of teasing out the facts. There are more maybes and probabilities with these stories than you might be used to in regular histories. Um, at the same time, we tried to be careful not to embellish, over embellish, or say things that we couldn't prove um, in trying to draw out the stories. And if in the end you feel there's more you want to know, more that needs to be done, that's good because we have completed what we see as stage one, but we hope very much that other people will be contributing narratives in the future, doing further research, and even writing a curriculum uh, to be used in the schools and that sort of thing. It's, a, it's not a dead project. It's something that can live on. The Sunk Squaw Servant, the deathbed scene of Sarah One Penny the Elder. On a May day in 1713 in Hartford, Connecticut, Sarah One Penny the Elder lay on her deathbed. She was surrounded by her three sons, Sienna, Cushoy, and Nanamaroos, and her sister Hannah. Mary Whiting, the 25-year-old daughter of Colonel William Whiting, listened to the old woman give instructions for the disposal of her estate. Sarah One Penny told her listeners that all of her land in the South Meadow in Hartford especially a small parcel of three to four acres by the wigwams should go to her grandson, Scipio. She told her sons to sell a small piece of meadow land in Middletown to pay her debts. She was a sunk squaw of the Wangunk, a woman of chiefly status and importance. She was also the servant of Colonel William Whiting and helped to raise his daughter, Mary, who stood by her now. 
<clears throat> Shortly after Sarah's death, Hannah One Penny and Mary Whiting appeared in the probate court of Hartford to attest to Sarah's dying wishes regarding Scipio. The Hartford court ordered Colonel William Whiting to oversee Scipio and to take care as guardian that his lands be improved for his best advantage. Seven months after their mother's death, Sienna, Cushoy, and Nana Marus recorded the deed, selling the Sunk Squaw's land in Middletown in accordance with her wishes after petitioning the Middletown court for permission. Sarah One Penny the Elder owned land in the South Meadow of Hartford. It's very likely she was laid to rest in the ancient burying ground. She does not appear on any sextants list, but as a Hartford landowner and servant in a Hartford household, it would have been a natural choice for her resting place. Historians have often mistaken Sarah the Elder for her daughter, also named Sarah One Penny, who died in Middletown. They also have failed to realize that she was the Sunk Squaw mentioned in other documents, but not called by her anglicized name. She was called by her native name, or just referred to as the Sunk Squaw. Sarah One Penny the Elder began a tradition in her family of using English law, in this case the probate court, to secure her wishes. She was the granddaughter of Sequin, the grand sachem of the Wangug, the niece of Sequasin, who had first invited the English to Hartford, and the wife of Pulamskin. Her action on her deathbed resulted in many of her descendants writing wills to preserve their lands. Indeed, every will written by a native person that I have found in Connecticut up through 1868 can trace some lineage to Sarah One Penny the Elder. How is that? Actually, how did that happen? How did that happen? What do you, how do you I mean? mean uh, so she had all those children or different husbands? Or what was it? Well, she, um, so her children also left wills. Her daughter also left a will. Then um, she raised a woman named Amy Puwamskin. Amy Puwamskin also left a will. Um, all of the native people who left wills had some association with her or her family. Not, they weren't necessarily descended from her, mm -hmm. but they were Wangunk who had a connection with the One Penny or Mamnatch family. Thank you. Sure. Philip and Ruth Moore, colonists of color, uh, should be kind of a question mark there, probably. Um, in the land records of Hartford in 1676, Philip Moore made his first entrance into the colonial record. Perhaps he was a veteran of the recent war between colonists and native people known as King Philip's War. Wherever he came from, however he obtained his land, Moore became a self-sufficient yeoman farmer just like his neighbors. He grew flax, grazed sheep, owned a horse, pig, and cow, and tended an apple orchard. Ruth Moore was a typical colonial housewife. She carded wool that a neighbor probably spun for her into yarn. Her work in the kitchen was laborious. Raising their children had its ups and downs. Young Philip got into a bit of trouble as an adolescent, um, but he eventually married a woman named Lydia, and his parents saw him become a landowner in his own right. At his death, Philip Moore Sr. left an estate of 100 pounds for his wife and children. His wife died a year later and lovingly remembered to give her best frying pan to Susanna Sirius, her daughter-in-law, as she called her. The Moores have two children, Philip Jr. This is the ancestry tree that we've done. Philip Jr. married to Lydia and Susanna, who was married to Cato Sirius, an indentured servant to Reverend Timothy Woodbridge. When Cato's indenture was over, he too became a landowner. The Moors had seven grandchildren. The family were baptized. Um, they owned the covenant of the Congregational Church. And their family Bible was a treasured possession. The Moors were of African descent. Philip Moore Sr. may even, come, may even have come directly from Africa. We, we don't know. In 1695, when Philip Sr. died, he could go to his grave, proud of his accomplishments, 
and secure in his knowledge that his family was provided for. They were not wealthy, but they were of good standing financially, friendly with their neighbors and members of their church. But time was not good to the Moore family. Whereas most white colonists grew more prosperous, the Moors lost land and wealth over time. Philip Moore Jr. died a few years after his parents, and the loss of this younger patriarch was no doubt a blow to the family's ability to maintain their farm. But it wasn't just that. The male Moors found themselves in trouble with the law. Philip III was charged heavy fines he could not pay and found himself indentured to pay off the debt. Cato was indentured to Reverend Woodbridge, and while we don't know why, it's possible he was in the same situation as his fellow servant, the Indian John Wobbin, whom Woodbridge bought for a debt. Sarah Moore, Lydia's daughter, became a single mother and was on poor relief. John Moore, the only man not in servitude, quit claimed land to his white neighbor in the same year rumors began that the colony would ban land ownership by blacks. As the color line came to demarcate free from unfree, racism deepened. By the late 1730s, the Moors were gone from Hartford's records insofar as we could trace them. Once valued Christian neighbors, the Moors became landless charges on the town and finally were forgotten. No historical investigation between then and now has examined how and why this happened. The Moors simply ceased to be part of Hartford's known history, whereas they should have been a central part of it, at the very least as a cautionary tale about what happens when racial ideology replaces ideas about Christian fellowship. Lords and wood bridges, merchants and ministers. Cato Sirius, son-in-law of Philip and Ruth Moore, was one of the Reverend Woodbridge's servants, one of his many servants. Reverend Timothy Woodbridge was the minister of the First Church, First Church of Christ, tongue twister there, and one of the founders of Yale College in New Haven. He was Yale's president for a time, and in fact, Woodbridge Hall is named after him, which is where the president's office is now at Yale. Woodbridge married widows. He married Mahidabel Willis Foster, the widow of the minister who preceded him in the first church. And when she died, he married Abigail Lord, the widow of the late Richard Lord, who had been the richest man in town. Richard Lord made his money in part from the operation of the cabbage tree plantation in the Caribbean and from other merchant activities back in Hartford. Abigail and Timothy Woodbridge became Hartford's power couple, if you will. They each brought property to the marriage, much of it in the form of human beings. While Cato Sirius and John Wobbin may have been indentured, the vast majority of the people in the household were enslaved. Andrew and Tamar met when the Lord Woodbridge households combined, and they became a couple. But a child out of wedlock resulted in the two being whipped for fornication. Remember that enslaved people had no right to marry or they could not do so without a master's permission. So the fact that they were unmarried when they had a child resulted in their being whipped for fornication, but they had no control over it, um, except to not be a couple. They married, finally, and had two more children, and then were given, given with their son Daniel to Abigail's son Elisha when he got married. When Reverend Woodbridge died, Lydia, one of Andrew and Tamar's daughters, was given to his daughter in Massachusetts. She was just 12 years old. When an enslaved person in the Woodbridge household died, the body was laid to rest in the ancient burying ground, anonymously and without ceremony. The Yale website tells us, quote, slavery underpinned many facets of colonial New England, from the household to the field, from the legal system to religious education, end quote. The website's authors seem to be inferring that the Reverend and Mrs. Woodbridge owned slaves in order to educate them to be Christians. And while several of the enslaved people in the household were baptized, the labor they performed and the punishments they took were the same as in other households. The owning of people by ministers 
gave the practice a societal approbation that made it all the easier for others to do so as well. And as we see from the Lord Woodbridge relationship tree, it shows um, the yellow are the enslaved uh, people. Um, as we see from the relationship tree, it's not quite accurate to claim Reverend Woodbridge owned, quote, some slaves. He trafficked in people with his wife, splitting up families so that his own could be more comfortable. Andrew and Tamar, Hager, Coffee, Sabelle, Candace, Jacob, Dinah, Hannah, Robin, Caesar, Joe, Lydia, Isabella, Daniel, Sam, Diego, and one unnamed child were just 18 of the known enslaved people to pass through their household and into the burying ground across the street. The Orphan Ward, Joseph Deuce. Joseph Deuce, also known as Joseph Jennings, was born in 1703 in the midst of his father Abda's lawsuit against Thomas Richards and his heirs. Abda was the son of Hannah Deuce, an African woman enslaved by Richards and the Englishman who sexually assaulted her, John Jennings. Hannah's rape was never prosecuted. Instead, she was whipped for having sex out of wedlock and her assailant was charged with child support when she bore a son. Abda then turned the tables when he became a man and demanded his freedom because, he said, his father was a free man and thus he was entitled to be free. A jury agreed with Abda, but his would-be owner appealed and a tribunal that included Colonel William Whiting overturned the jury, saying that Abda had already been passed along as property in a will. And so because he had already legally been named property, he could not be free. Um, for reasons still unknown, however, the, the Richards family nevertheless did set Abda free. I don't know if they were trying to test the law and really did want to free him or just what the situation was. Thus, Joseph was the son of a free man. Abda lived only six more years, and after he died, he left an estate of 14 pounds. I want you to remember that just a few years earlier, Philip Moore Sr. had left an estate of 100 pounds. Right? So he leaves an estate of 14 pounds. In his inventory, the only item of luxury was a violin. Joseph's mother, Lydia, needed a guardian for her son. Nothing more is known about Lydia. Joseph is described as a mulatto, as was his father, but Lydia may have been an English or native woman. The duty of guardianship passed to colonist Robert Shirley, but Shirley died the next year. The record is silent about Joseph's fate for six more years, but when he was 16, he chose Thomas Stanley of Farmington to be his guardian, and at age 18, Samuel Judd. And then the record is quiet about Joseph Deuce until his death in 1789. Seventy years of silence for a son whose grandmother and father made legal history. When Joseph died, he left an estate in Hartford that included one house worth two pounds. You can imagine what that house was, no, probably nothing more than a lean-to. And goods that amounted to some old shirts and an old pair of breeches and one coat made of broadcloth. The estate's entire worth was three pounds and 14 shillings. He died in abject poverty at the age of 86. They called him Mr. Gibson. <laughs> Samuel Gibson was a popular grocer. He stocked the goods Hartford's residents wanted and needed. He played the fiddle, undoubtedly creating some enjoyment in the evenings for his neighbors. Hardworking and personable, he and his apprentice, young Frisbee, delivered the world's goods to Hartford. Gibson had seen a good deal of the world. Born into slavery in the West Indies, he was purchased by a Mr. Frisbee who lived in Guilford, Connecticut. Frisbee allowed Gibson to buy his own freedom. Sam then moved to Hartford to start his grocery business, where he became very successful. He advertised his wares in Hartford Current and the American Mercury. He was known as far as Boston and New York. He died suddenly of a fever, 
and was mourned by all who knew him in the town, according to his obituary. He's the only person we really found that had uh, an obituary, a formal obituary. The obituary writer recalled his, I want to quote, strict integrity and punctuality, emphasizing that Gibson, Gibson had earned, quote, the esteem and confidence of the community. Gibson established a fair reputation in Connecticut, New York, Boston, etc. The obituary continued, as a trader, no man's credit is fairer, and the conduct of few men more irreproachable, end quote. Most striking is the conclusion, quote, such is the reverie of fortune in this world that the son of his former master at Guilford has for several years been a clerk in his store. And to reward this youth for his fidelity, am I to testify his affection to his father's memory? He has left the whole of his property to him, end quote. The obituary speculated that the sum of money would be, quote, very handsome. For all the notable characters whose personalities brought them vividly to life for us, the most striking finding in the research was also the most gut-wrenching. The nearly 125 unnamed people of color whose burials were recorded but whose names were not. Over the centuries, sextons and others recorded the death dates, causes of death, and sometimes ages of people while omitting their names and often their sex or gender. Rarely was the master's name missing. Few things mean more to us than our names. Our names connect us to our ancestors, to places, to our accomplishments. We go to great lengths to protect our reputations, our good names. On some occasions, often religious, we might take on new names as a sign of rebirth. Already, colonization and anglicization had removed indigenous names from Native and African people. The indignity of having no name at death was an erasure. How could one be remembered if one had no name? Who was the unnamed person recorded as a squaw? Who were the 115 unnamed Negroes, Negro children, Negro infants, Negro maids, and so on? You may notice on the website that the records for each person are numbered, but we very deliberately did not choose to use numbers in place of names in order to not further dehumanize people from whom so much had already been taken. Even where we had people of the same first name without surnames, we did not say Betty One or Betty Two, but if we had you know, if all we had was Negro man, we would just leave it at that and, and go on. I believe that some of these unnamed may finally be named with more research, but the vast majority will not. And in fact, since we ended the project, I did find the name of one uh, so-called Negro maid. Uh, her name was Sarah. Her anglicized name was Sarah. So we did correct that. How do we understand this? The dehumanization embedded in the institution of slavery is nowhere more manifest than in the denial of the ordinary dignities afforded to most people. The name of one's own, the right to a family, to believe as one chooses, to organize one's own time, to be remembered in death. When Northern slavery is compared to Southern slavery, the common myth is that somehow Northern masters were more benevolent, less harsh, more family-oriented. If we could ask these 125 unnamed persons about that, what do you think they would tell us? It is telling that the same disease that killed a large number of enslaved people on southern plantations, that is dropsy, uh, in this case a form of edema caused by nutritional deficiencies from eating too much rice and not enough protein, was a leading cause of death among African Americans in Hartford. And that included free African Americans even into the late 18th and early 19th centuries. So why didn't they have enough protein? Could they go hunting or something? Uh, they were poor, I think, largely. Uh -huh. um, and rice was a staple for the diet. So the people who owned them didn't even treat them at all. It, they weren't feeding them in a way that they could get proper nutrition. In the 19th century, after the Civil War, 
the local historians of Hartford tried to minimize Hartford's role with the institution of slavery. They left enslaved people off the published sextons lists and out of the history books. But the unnamed were not just written out by 19th century historians who ignored them. They were unnamed in the records by people who did know them, who looked at their corpses and knew their faces, their bodies, and most certainly their names. In all of our remembering and recovering, these are the ones to whom we owe the most. We owe them a truthful story. So why haven't you heard these stories before? I mean, we can argue about what makes a person's life important historically. And the, but I think these stories are as fascinating as any of Reverend Thomas Hooker and Governor John Haynes, John Winthrop Jr. and John Mason. We may have less about them, but they're very interesting. Um, in fact, it's exactly the argument about what, what makes someone historically important that accounts for the absence of these stories. History is a discipline that really began as the history of governments and nation states, and often that meant kings and queens, right? Individuals of importance. Um, and in Hartford, the, the white families of note were the people who governed, the Woodbridges, the Lords, the Willises, the Winthrops, and so on. Um, natives and Africans were considered too uncivilized to have been capable of real governance. But there's another intervening factor that I think helps explain why even genealogists and antiquarians writing local histories ignored the population of color. As I mentioned earlier, the Civil War that ended slavery in 1865 took a toll on the nation. White Connecticut soldiers became local heroes, as existing monuments to them attest. Erasure of enslaved people helped erase memories of the institution of slavery in a world increasingly hostile to it. In an us versus them mentality, the North was not the one responsible for slavery. Thus, when local histories were being written, evidence of enslavement got buried or downplayed. Thus arose the story of abolitionist Connecticut and its more benevolent form of slavery where it did exist. Right? And those are, it is of course true that there were abolitionists in Connecticut, some very powerful abolitionists and very prominent ones who helped change uh, the course of the nation's history. But it's not true that slavery was more benevolent. Um, more benevolent than what? More benevolent than what life was like for enslaved people in the South. Um, there's also kind of a myth that Connecticut did not have plantations. And that's something I'd like to correct as well. In the South, when historians look at uh, what makes a great planter versus a lesser planter versus a yeoman, right? One of the things we talk about is having more than 20 slaves. So some great planters in the South, of course, had hundreds of slaves. Even in the 17th century, you had King Carter who had thousands of slaves, right? But for the most part, in order to become considered a great planter, you only needed more than 20. That put you in the top 1% of slave owners in the South. So look here at Norman Morrison. Dr. Norman Morrison, uh, and the enslaved people he owned are almost completely forgotten. Morrison had farms in many towns, but none larger than his farm in Bolton, now in Vernon, because of town boundary shifting, staffed by recent arrivals from West Africa who came on the Speedwell out of Middletown just months before Morrison died in 1761. The green uh, are his farms, and then the um, the two kind of couple things are his um, ships, I think. I can't really read it, but if you, if you go to the relationship tree on the website, you can see the whole thing and you'll be able to understand it better. Um, Morrison had a 7 16th share in that schooner, the Speedwell. To make sure he got his choice of workers, 
Morrison bought beads and beaded baskets in London and had them shipped to Newport, Rhode Island. When I was researching a different topic in Newport, I came across an account book that talked about the beads and beaded baskets he was buying for the slave trade to grease the wheels with the traders. They, they weren't paying for the slaves. He had to do that with money, but he would grease the wheels um, with the traders. These were trade goods to be distributed in Africa as gifts. This educated Scotsman, that is Morrison, trained as a physician, found the slave trade more profitable than his medical practice. When he died of smallpox, his will left the captive people in limbo. He ordered them to be sold, but the courts dragged out the process for nearly a decade. The whole debacle has not commanded one sentence in histories till now. Um, recently, Teresa Bega, a genealogist, family historian, and public educator, took on the town of Greenwich to ensure that a historic black and indigenous burial site was not erased. Vegas said, and I quote, everyone who has ever lived has the right to have their stories told and preserved. They have a right to a sacred space where they can rest in peace. We need to tell their stories, end quote. I want to end with this thought. My work on the website wrapped up. I felt I had learned so much, but also that I knew so little. I needed time to sit back and try to understand what we had uncovered. Wangong servants, enslaved Africans, free African Americans, indentured whites, and free white people could all live under the same roof in Hartford. They could and did attend church services together. They were all, they were all buried in the same burying ground. Yet brutal lines of separation were always visible. Even in the case where people of color seemed to have crossed those lines, they were often sent back over. The story of Philip and Ruth Moore reveals how the family members of an independent and free black landowner could find themselves on the wrong side of the law and have their hard-won freedom eroded. We see how a man of the cloth could in one breath vouch to teach a newly baptized enslaved person the Christian religion and with the next order her whipped. We see how a white sexton responsible for the burial of the dead who knew the deceased during their lifetimes could record the details of their passing, ages, causes of death, who paid for the grave, and omit their names from the record. To be shocked and appalled is a natural reaction, but it's much more important to try to understand how that was possible. It's much more important to analyze the evidence for an explanation than to simply deplore that state of affairs. It's also important to see the bonds of affection that occasionally existed, though we shouldn't see them through rose-colored glasses. Samuel Gibson, who had to buy his freedom from his master, and I'm sure it wasn't cheap, must have felt some affection for his apprentice, his former master's son. Gibson left the boy his business and all of his personal possessions. In a world in which Gibson's natal family was denied to him, perhaps he found the ties formed in bondage preferable to having no ties at all. Captain Nichols must have felt something positive towards Boston, an enslaved man he set free who became Hartford's last black governor. Black governors were men who were chosen to be intermediaries between the white and black populations, and they were elected by the black community to serve ceremonial. But remember, that when Nichols gave Boston property and helped set him up, he also kept, another, uh, kept other enslaved people in their, in their condition of slavery. Slavery was not repugnant to him. Freedom was something he decided to give Boston. And that's the exercise of arbitrary power. And while Nichols' decision may have benefited Boston, we must remain aware of the context what Nichols could give, he could also deny. Such power over others should never be in the hands of individuals. Hartford today remains a diverse city full of contradictions, inequalities, opportunities, and problems. Its streets have changed names over the centuries, but the basic map is still the one drawn in, 17, in 1640. Its ancient burying ground holds its past. A memorial to the black governors, which you see here, 
and to some of the other enslaved people does undo some of the erasure, but there's more to be done. Our future is more linked to the past than we sometimes realize. Thomas Hooker was often touted in the historical literature as bringing <coughs> democracy to Connecticut. If Hooker planted that seed, then Caesar Augustus Stevenson deserves some credit for cultivating it. This black revolutionary war soldier, along with James Cromwell, Freeman Augustus Hill, and John Barter, all black men, successfully filed a petition for freedom in the General Assembly as the new nation was in its infancy. He cited the law of nature in the Declaration of Independence and the ideas of equal freedom and equal protection of the laws as justification for their freedom. Let's make sure Hartford's next generation learns a more complex story about its people and its struggles for freedom and equality. to take questions yes can you give me the website again yes all right so www dot and this is all one african native burials ct dot org but i think if you google if you google uncovering their history or put my name in my last name is hermes like the greek god no relation <laughs> <laughs> And one more question. Yeah. How does one get into this burying ground? How can we visit this place? So the burying ground is open um, most days, uh, open in the morning, and they unlock the gates and you can walk through it. There are occasionally tours that are advertised. Um, the president of the Ancient Burying Ground Association, Ty Tryon, is back here. And I don't know if you want to add anything to that about accessibility. Um, it's free. Um, come on up. Uh, the brochure is available. There's a map uh, of finding gravestones at Gold Street entrance. And um, come up and enjoy the day in Hartford. Yep. Okay. So there's two ways in. From Gold Street is the main entrance, and then there's also an entrance on Main Street. Is it? Oh, God. Yeah, I have a question about the black governors. Yes. I think like, London, I think, was the first one. Somewhere I read that. And he was a slave of a Seymour? Yes. And what kind of uh, activities were they engaged in? Yeah, I mean, so we don't know a lot about them. First of all, there were black governors in Hartford, but there were also black governors in other cities around Connecticut. So there were some in the New Haven area as well that were separate. Um, but the ones in Hartford, I mean, Typically, the day after the, gov the white governor, the political governor of Connecticut, was elected by the white po male population, they would hold the election for the black governor. In one instance only was the black governor appointed. And that caused, quite, uh, that caused a little bit of a stir. Um, and that was during the American Revolution. And so, for the most part, they would, um, they would hear disputes between people um, so if the African population was having trouble with, um, you know, their neighbor or something like that, or someone in their household, they would mediate it. If they were having trouble with even an owner or something, they might um, be able to mediate that situation. There were also black sheriffs who were appointed by the black governors, and we have a narrative about one of them named Neptune on our site. Um, so they performed important roles in the community of having access to high up white people, right? And being able to take some of the problems the community was having. But I think the whites also thought that black governors could regulate the black community and kind of keep down uh, unrest or resistance as well. I did have uh, actually a two-part question here. <clears throat> Uh, the uh, enslaved children, now their parents worked in these wealthy homes, were they allowed to uh, be educated? So were they having their basic reading and writing? Everything was really at the behest of the master or the mistress, right? So, I mean, children were not typically, enslaved children were not typically educated. 
Um, but that doesn't mean that an individual owner couldn't decide to teach them to read. So they were basically, the black people were an uneducated uh, group of people, and that, of course, kept them in slavery, probably. Well, they're kept in slavery because they're held, they're held for life under the law, mm -hmm. and they can't free themselves unless they purchase their freedom, which the owner has to agree to. So even if, a, even if a, an enslaved person had managed to save enough money to buy his or her freedom, the owner doesn't have to agree to that. I don't think that's true. I think no? that was in, in the statutes that if, if a person could afford whatever their fair market value was at the time that they wanted to buy their freedom, the, the law would support them. If the master said no, they have the right to take the master to court. That, that did happen. Well, I'll have, to, I'll have to look into it then. I mean, um, it, it may be that I didn't find that. Um, it, may, it may be part of the, I wonder if it's part of the gradual emancipation um, statute or something. You don't think so? No, it's yes. in statutes. Um, but like what year, do you know? At least from about the, the uh, 1750s. Um, I don't know if it started in the, in the code of 1660, but... Okay. All right. Thank you for that. I'll look into it. Yeah. So I don't want to. I don't want to make a mistake about that. In Connecticut, slaves have rights. They slaves have, don't have rights. I they mean, very, have, they have all the rights, but freedom. They don't have the right to wander freely or to leave. But um, the reason I know a lot about this, um, and it's it's specific to the town of Weathersfield, is that Weathersfield has had the very good fortune not to lose any of their records to fire or flood or whatever. And we have uh, numerous cases of slaves that would take their masters to court and win. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't dispute that people can, uh, that enslaved people can have access to courts, um, but they don't have the right to marry. They cannot have control of their children when their children are sold away from them. They have no ability to prevent that. Um, they cannot keep the money they earn for extra... Um, I, I think that that's in the statutes as well. The law required, and then to change from um, decade to decade, but it required masters to give a certain number of hours of free time to their slaves per week in which they were free to rest or visit, or if they had a skill that they could hire themselves out for, the master was not entitled to take any wages that they earned. And we have court cases where the slave sued his master and recovered his money. I think, um, I, I agree with a lot of what you, almost everything that you're saying. And, um, this was a very harsh society that was based on a pecking order. You know, the lords were probably lords at one time in, in England. And um, they believed that they were the ones that had all the rights. But the Connecticut laws, if you consider slave, slavery laws across the nation at the time, were quite a bit more liberal. I don't, um, I don't think that I... I don't think that I've seen evidence of that. Um, there, there is the, there is the 1784 gradual emancipation law, right? But the last enslaved person in Connecticut is not freed until 1848, um, and, and that is because of age. Um, you know how, how yeah. everybody likes welfare even today. Welfare is a hot topic, and um, the government was afraid during the process of emancipation that elderly slaves, and by that I think they meant like 45 or 50, um, not become a burden to their, their um, place of residence. And so uh, this is one of the things that, that bothers me about the code, as, as I know it, that um, older slaves were not given the same kind of consideration as a younger, let's say somebody who's 20. There was a case, I mean, there was a case in Weathersfield, and I don't have a name or date. It comes late, about in the early 19th century, um, after the second emancipation law, where a family is, uh, uh, is suing 
in order to try to get their white, former white owners to help support them, and they are unsuccessful. Um, it, it would depend upon their age and um, their physical condition. But um, the last slave to die in Connecticut um, was, was old. Um, and they, the government saw to it that the owner had the responsibility to take care of that person's physical needs until they died so that they would not fall, um, at, they would not become the responsibility of the community. And this is a very complex story. And, um, it is. It is. is there, uh, are there any other questions at this point that haven't been asked? Sure. Uh, I was wondering if in Hartford there was a um, dock where slave, uh, slaves were brought, like they were in Middletown. I know recently uh, the United Nations uh, gave the first plaque in the United States uh, in honor of uh, the remembering of that slave trade to the city of Middletown. I yes. was very privileged to be able to attend that yeah. ceremony and I was opened by a wonkunk. Yes. Gary O'Neill. Yes, oh, Gary from East, yeah. East, East Hampton, yes. And I was wondering if the same story was repeated in Hartford, or was that as far north as that trade went well, by ship? I mean, typically typically the ships did uh, let the slaves out in, or sell the slaves in Middletown. Um, and then they were brought by land up to Hartford or by smaller ships. Um, I don't know if, I actually really don't know the answer to the question about whether Hartford had uh, a dock. Um, I, yeah. The customs house was in Middletown, which uh, yes, was why the they all got there. Um, but, you know, in the, early, in the early 17th century, they may have had, uh, they may have had a place in Hartford um, on the river. Um, but I don't, I don't know for certain. I'm, like the Lords, and the Willises and families like that, they had warehouses that um, down on the river and docks that went out, uh, wharves that went out into the river, and it's possible that their ships came up that far. I just am not sure about that. Yes? Um, I wanted to ask a little bit about Ms. One Penny, who you spoke about earlier in yes. the lecture, and what tribe was she part of? She was Wonguk. Wonguk. And yes. What um, area did that cover? I grew up in uh, Rhode Island and went to public school in Rhode Island, so I didn't know. I don't know about that tribe. So. Well, you know, a lot of people don't know about this <laughs> about this tribe, and I have spent about twenty years doing research on this tribe. Um, so many people think of the Wangunk as located in Middletown, um, but Soeg or Sequin, who's the same person. He was located at Middletown, but he had sons and daughters who were up and down the river. So Sequassan, his son, who was the sachem of the chief of Hartford, was also Wangunk. Um, Terramugus in Weathersfield was Wangunk. Um, Tohishke in Haddam, uh, Sarah One Penny in Middletown, and her mother Saponimo um, were, were both in Middletown and Hartford. Um, and so they went, I think, as far as Killingly. Um, they have, so some of the, some of them can be found even in Guilford, but I think that's through marriage. Montalese was one of the sons of Soeg, and he, what, he married into the Quinnipiac. So oftentimes when men would marry into a tribe, they would take on that tribal affiliation. So, um, so the Wangunk, are were much larger than people have realized. And I think the research kind of establishing that is only being done now. It, they were sometimes called the river tribes or the Matabesics, or they had these little, little names and people thought they were different tribes, but they weren't. Um, and Soeg was allied with the Narragansett. His daughter, Wawarme, you may see her avenue right up near Colt Park, um, well, Warme was married to my antinomy, who was the grand sachem of the Narragansetts. So he had an extensive network, um, and I have um, done a genealogy that shows the branching out 
of this family and how they existed really all along the river until they finally moved to Farmington. Many of them moved to Farmington where the Tunxis and the Wangunk and some Quinnipiac become known as the Farmington Indians. And then a number of those become part of the Brothertown movement. That is a Christianized movement led by Samson Ockham of the Mohegan. And they move west to first to Oneida, to Brothertown, and then to Wisconsin. So you can trace the family a long way. And yes, one little follow-up. Um, you described her, I think, as a squat, a squat. Some squat. Squat's got um, servant, and I don't know what that means. Well, so her title, Sung Squaw, means she's chiefly, but she's also a servant to William Wyatt. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I've been working on, in her will, she names Whiting uh, as the overseer, he's named as the overseer of Scipio. Well, and for 20 years, um, I've been tracing this fellow, Scipio Two Shoes, as his name is, and we found that he is the same person as Scipio Brown in Newport, Rhode Island. And William Whiting and Scipio Two Shoes moved together to Newport, each to start over. Whiting marries a rich widow. Scipio just goes and becomes a carter and has a carting business and is one of the most litigious people. But because he has an African father, he's in Newport, he becomes Scipio Brown Negro. Um, so it's a, he has a very close association with Whiting, who is actually quite good to him um, as, a, as a kind of mentor in a way. Um, and yet it's a complicated relationship, right? Because, yeah. Yeah, well, you mentioned uh, religious, religious a couple of times, and Congregationalists and Anglicans are well, this point, uh, what um, were there any Catholic slave owners? Just because of their religion, I wouldn't think there would be. Well, but you know, you did, it's always Congregationalist or some other Protestant, and not not even Lutherans for that matter. I can't, I can't tell you for certain when the first Catholic comes to Hartford, um, but we did find that in the ancient burying ground there were Catholic French people from Haiti who uh, left during the Haitian Revolution and came and took refuge in Hartford, and they are buried in the ancient burying ground. Um, but I don't, know, I don't know of too many Catholics. Um, or Lutherans, right? Or, or uh, Lutherans, it's They're tougher. Close. So like um, uh, Morrison there, he was Scottish. Yeah. Uh, he, I don't know if he was Scots Presbyterian or just what he was. Um, but the... So neither the Congregationalists nor the Anglicans had any prohibition against slavery. Eventually the Quakers do. Yeah. But Samuel Sewell, who is famous as a judge in the Salem Witchcraft Trials, wrote the first anti-slavery tract published in North America called The Selling of Joseph. And he tried to encourage his fellow Congregationalists to stop owning slaves. So there are people, I think the Congregationalists are torn, right? And there's no rule against it. The Quakers become the first to really prohibit it as a religious group. And I can't answer your question about the Catholics. Um, well, that's fair. You can answer it for a bit. Okay. Well, well enough. Question? Any, any other questions? <laughs> Well, listen, thank you all for coming, and I appreciate the questions and the thoughtful questions, and I will, you know, certainly do more look, looking into uh, the code and see what I've missed. Thank you very much.